will publish the recording uh, in YouTube or yeah, some way, probably with our YouTube channel. Oh, yeah. Okay, so welcome everyone once again to a new Unity Community Hours edition. This time is the SUSE Hack Week edition, and we will explain later briefly what the Hack Week is for those of you that don't know. This is the agenda for today. So we have four topics. Let's get started with the first one, which is about getting some help for testing ARM. Because not sure if you already know, but we already have client packages for OpenSUSE Lib 15.2, which are available at master. That means that right now, if you want to onboard um, a Lib 15.2 ARM client or Arch 64 client, that's something that you can already do with a, a master server, or if you prefer the development development branch. And um, yeah, we started to work uh, as well on getting the server and proxy installable on ARM as well, for now, only for lib15.2. Um, we want to add support for this architecture for some other operating systems. Maybe soon we will have it for CentOS, for Alma Linux, for Amazon Linux. Those, are, those two last are operating systems that we will be adding soon. And we would really appreciate if the community can help us testing those new this new architecture. Because, well, we don't have the bandwidth to handle everything. And in some cases, we don't have the, the required hardware. And uh, we could use we could use a lot of help here. So if you give it a try, I will publish some instructions on the website uh, next week uh, to, to help you getting started. It's pretty much the same you would do with the um 62 bit architecture the intel 60, 60 so, sorry 64 uh, bit architecture but uh yeah you just need to replace uh, a couple of things to get things working so well that's the message from my part if you have a raspberry pi or whatever other hardware with this architecture help us let us know how things are working if something is broken ping us create a bug report and we will have a look. Any questions about this or comments or? Yeah, so just one thing for, for the proxy, uh, a Raspberry Pi should be fine for the server, uh, maybe unless you get one of those uh, models with eight gigabytes of RAM, it might be insufficient. Just, so other ARM hardware might be more fit for the server. Ah, uh, yeah, that's that's true. Yeah, for the for the Raspberry Pi proxy will work on any Raspberry Pi that supports OpenSUSE. I think that's at least Raspberry Pi three and four. Not sure about two. Same for the clients and for the server. Yeah, eight gigabytes is the bare minimum even for development environments. Okay, then the next thing is the hack week project from Pau and from me yeah, which was maybe we, we should start by explaining what is hack week right 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 let me that's the next slide <laughs> right, okay. that we were working on this whole week so for those of you that don't know what a hack week is is an event that we have at SUSE one time each year where all the SUSE engineers come basically collaborate or enhance any project they want or research some new things, start a new project. It all depends on what, what you want to do and what are your interests. In this case, um, the last year and also this year, I was working on adding more operating systems as a unique clients with some people. Last year, we were able to add Oracle and Debian 9 and 10. And for this year, we have some more surprises. So the first one is Amazon Linux 2. If you are Amazon Web Services user, maybe you already know that this is, I think it's the most used operating system in the Amazon cloud. It's basically a CentOS 7 with several changes, but in general is mostly compatible. For now, we are adding support only for the X 
8664 architecture once again. If you want to see Arch 64, then help us with that. We can enable the builds and then you can give it a try. And the things I tested are, of course, the onboarding of salt and salt. By the way, I have a typo here, so it should say salt and salt SSH minions. Formulas are tested as well, states, remote commands, package management, the CB audit as well, which seems to work out of the box as we will see on a screenshot on the next slides. And basically everything else that is working for CentOS 7 should work fine with one minor exception, which is about the back package providers. I don't know if uh, you already use this, this thing, but it tells you what provider is giving you a package and it also allows you to check that uh, a given package comes from the expected provider by checking the GPG key. This is something we are going to add in the next week, in the next weeks, but for now it is still not available. And we are enabling support for salt, but not for traditional clients. Also acting as virtualization host is not supported because right now Amazon Linux is not installed on bare metal. There is something I still need to research because I know that there are some bare metal instances, EC2 instances at Amazon Web Services, but to be honest, I never tried them before. And you can expect this in master during the next week. And then on the stable version of Uni for the next one, which should be 2021-04. So I don't have a demo, but as you can see, here we have an Amazon Linux 2 client onboarded. It's showing that we have package updates pending. You can perform a reboot and pretty much everything you want. And here the interesting thing is that Amazon Linux 2 is providing the erratas. So you have all the bug fixes and security patches here. I could not test this because, well, there is something interesting about the Amazon instances, at least Amazon Linux instances, is that when you when you create them, they get automatically updated, unless you disable that via CFN init or cloud init. I don't remember what, what the name is. So in the end, that means that I could not get a, an image that was old enough to, to test if applying the patches was working. But given that we have the erratas, should work just fine. So that is for Amazon Linux. If you have any questions, please ask. Otherwise, I will jump into the next one, or you can ask later. OK, then the next one is Alma Linux 8. You should Sorry, I was on mute. Short oh, question. Yeah. Which flavor do they use as Amazon Linux? You mean, what do you mean with flavor? What what version? Is it Debian or is it uh, ah, well, is the it family. CentOS? Now I understand. Yeah, it's based on CentOS 7. On CentOS, OK. Yeah. OK. That was it from my side. OK, then there are no more questions. Then the next one is Alma Linux 8. Um, you should be or already aware of the situation with CentOS 8, and not talking about CentOS 8 stream, but CentOS 8 is going out of um, support or it's the, the life cycle will arrive by the end of this year, which means that there is, let me put it this way, there is not going to be a CentOS which is a clone of RHEL 8 as we have today. You will have CentOS 8 stream, but this is slightly different. As a result of that, there are several communities making an effort to create a replacement for CentOS 8. And in this case, the first one that was able to produce something was Alma Linux 8, Alma Linux from, I think it's Cloud Linux, right, Pau? If I'm not wrong. Yes, it's it's Cloud Linux. It's a company in, well, in America, but really in, in Ukraine, Ukraine. And in this case, Alma Linux 8 is basically a clone of, of Rehel 8. 
Uh, there was an official release last week. Right now they are on release candidate one. And I think that they, there will be an stable version, I think by the end of the month or first or second week of April. Since this is a clone of Rehel 8 and CentOS 8, keep in mind that you will need content lifecycle management for the package management. Once again, we added the support only for Intel 64 bits. But if you want Arch 64 available as well, same story. We can enable it. You can give it a try and tell us how it's working. And the support is basically the same we already mentioned for Amazon Linux too. So salt, salt, salt SSH minions, formulas, states, commands, package management, CB audit is working as well. And in general, everything that is working right now for CentOS 8 or Oracle 8 or Regal 8. And there, well, there is the minor exception about the package providers that I already mentioned that should get fixed in the next weeks. No traditional stack, and you can expect this on master as well next week and on a stable for 2021-04. And as you can see here, I could check that the uh, errata management is working. You can see that this Alma Linux 8 instance has three critical, critical patches pending, one non-critical. And you can see that we have here all the errata synced. Here, as far as I could see, you don't really need to do anything uh, anything similar to what you do for CentOS. You don't need any third-party application to get information about the ratas and vulnerabilities. It just works out of the box, which is something really, really nice. And well, that's it for Alma Linux. So again, questions, comments? There is, as far as you know, there is no Alma Linux 7. So they are going to focus only on the most recent recent Rehel version. And of course, the, the next one, Rehel 9, when, when it's available. Other than that, it behaves exactly as CentOS 8 would do, with some minor exceptions about the name, name and lists of the modules you get from the upstream repositories. Okay, then that was my part. Wow, floor is yours. Yeah, so Alibaba Linux, Cloud Linux too. So this one is, I just wanted to add some other Linux and Rocky Linux was not available yet. So the, the other community clone of RHEL is going to be Rocky Linux. They are promising that they will make a release in early April, but Hack Week was this week, so I thought, yeah. What can I do? So um, I wanted to add Windows, and I'm working on Windows also, by the way. But since Windows is a more difficult target, I wanted to start with full support for uh, a Linux. And they use that as a template, let's say, to, to build on. Because uh, and that's exactly what I did. Uh, Alibaba Cloud Linux 2 is a RHEL 7.6 um, clone. Well, they add additional packages. On top of that, and even they install some software uh, directly with uh, PIP and that kind of, of um, language-specific tools, which posed a bit of a problem, but that's now solved. So again, it's, it's an, an, you can consider it another uh, RHEL 7 clone. So far, we have added support only for 886.64. ARM should be available soon, especially if you uh, try it. Uh, Everything that worked for CentOS 7 or RHEL 7 works. I even went as far as adding the traditional stack too. Um, and of course, uh, using this as a virtualization host is not supported, but not because of anything you need it wrong. It's just that I cannot get a bare metal instance of Alibaba Cloud Linux. So I could do some tricks to install it on, on bare metal, but yeah, it didn't really make a lot of sense. So essentially, anything that works for Rails 7 works for Alibaba Cloud Linux. And again, we are going to merge the the code next week. It's yeah, it's going to be a bit <laughs> a bit of, of a a bit difficult because we have been working in three different branches of code. Now we need to merge all that together, which is touching exactly the same places in the code. So we will need to do some yeah 
careful surgery there. But yeah, in the next version of, of Unity, we should have all, all these three new uh, Linux distros. And with that, I think that we can go for the next slide where we can show that, yeah, Unity supports now. Uh, oh, the, the, these are the screenshots. Yeah, so you can see that I, I'm running, but there's nothing really to see because it just behaves. You, you don't really mind. Yeah, so you can see here the errata. That's the only thing that will tell you that this is uh, another system. Uh, because other than that, this is what, uh, that, that's a, the a strong point of, of Unity. You don't really care if it's Alma Linux, uh, Alibaba Cloud Linux, uh, Celeste, Rel, or whatever it is. It's just a system that's managed, so you just say, add it to the system set manager, install the updates, create the content life cycle project, uh, filter and install only the software they want, avoid reboots, that kind of information. And all of this information is available. So for all the operating systems that we support. So there's no, no real difference. Uh, but as, as we have Alma Linux and with Amazon, Alibaba is providing errata information and the reboot information and all of that, which is really nice. Right, and the good thing about adding both Amazon Linux and, and Alibaba Linux is that, well, we are making Uni, let's say, cloud native, because now you can manage some operating systems that are, are only available on the on the Alibaba or Amazon uh, clouds. Well, strictly said for Amazon Linux, that's not true. If you want to test uh, Amazon Linux even with an Amazon account, you can still create virtual machines on, I think it's Hyper-V, VirtualBox, and VMware. You can download images and run them. So no problem about that. Oh yeah, Donald just pasted the, the link. Um, well, not related to Uni, but you, well, not directly, but you can even create Docker containers. There is a Docker image for Amazon Linux as well for some yeah. big tests. Yeah, also for Alibaba Cloud Linux too, is also uh, Alibaba is providing uh, images that you can download and install locally. And you can even get the updates offline, I mean, offline uh, out of the uh, Alibaba Cloud. So if you can install it in your data center or whatever and use it. Um, the interestingly, also, by the way, I, I discovered like uh, two hours ago that Alibaba Cloud Linux 3 is not announced. <laughs> it's not even in the, in the Alibaba Cloud, but packages are already available. So I will be looking into that very soon, as soon as, as I can install it anywhere, because there are packages, but they offer no images and it's not available as instances on their cloud. So I cannot really start it unless I do some tricks with, I don't know, starting with a base CentOS 8, old CentOS 8 or RHEL 8 image, and then try to upgrade that to Alibaba 3. I don't know. Yeah, but these new operating systems, cloud operating systems, we will support them too as soon as they are available. Right. And with that, the thing is that we are adding more and more clients that we support. And this is the complete list right now. Not only, well, in fact, the, the let's say, uh, official initial operating systems, SUSE Linux and OpenSUSE Lib, are now only a small part of the whole list because, well, we already support CentOS, Rehel, Oracle, and all the clones, Debian 9 and 10, three versions of Ubuntu, now Alma Linux 8, Amazon Linux 2. Astra Linux is coming soon. It's uh, This is from my last uh, hack week, the, the hack week last year, but I still need to ping the OBS people again so they enable the, the builds and we can release it. And I know that uh, someone from SUSE was having a look to get Raspbian working with uh, Uyuni as well during the hack week. I'm not sure about the progress, but maybe we will release it soon as well. So, well, the list is growing. Of course, if you want to see something else, well, ping us. We will see what we can do. Of course, if something is um, compatible with some other operating systems uh, system we have, then it's easier to add it. It's easier to add a distribution that is using uh, RPMs than if we want to add, for example, I don't know. Uh, Windows, maybe? <laughs> yeah, well, I was not only thinking about Windows or MacOS, but I was thinking about some other operating system, other Linux distributions, uh, such as Arch, for example. But still, that's something 
that can be researched. And of course, well, if you have some developer knowledge, then you can join us and help us in the effort. Yeah, yeah. If, if you're interested, if you're interested in Windows, Windows, get in touch because I will, I will continue with this in the coming days. Right. And if you want to consider some other, I don't know, uh, Debian clones or Rehel clones, I will send an email to the devil mailing list with a pull request that we are going to merge. So you can know what needs to be done in such situations. And maybe you can experiment a, a little. Yeah. Okay. So if, if there are no more questions about the clients, then I think we can move to Cedric's and Dan's presentation about this salt language server protocol. And we should also have Silvio so here talking about the containers, or unique containers. I don't see Silvio yet, so let's start with Cedric and Dan. Yeah. Okay, hi. Can you see my screen? Does the screen share work and audio okay? Yeah, yeah. everything's fine. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having us. So my name is Dan and uh, Cedric is going to present the second half. We have uh, worked on a simple, uh, on a, um, yeah, on a prototype of a language server protocol implementation for salt states. So for those of you who are now thinking, what on earth is the language server protocol? The idea behind the language server protocol is, this is, as, I, as the name hints, a protocol for, communicate, uh, for a communication of tools with editors. So if you take a look at your average, at the average uh, n times n problem, you have n languages, m editors, and if you want uh, your language to be supported in all the editors, you have to write 50 different integrations. And the language server protocol provides a uh, adjacent RPC protocol for uh, which an editor could talk to, the, uh, to a server and ask it for code completion, for diagnostics, for documentation, for jumping to definitions, and so on and so on, and all, uh, all kinds of stuff. And the nice thing about this is you just implement your server once and you get a whole ton of features in various different, uh, for all kinds of editors. So for BI, VS Code, et cetera, et cetera. So, and since there's nothing like this for salt states, we uh, try to tackle this. And uh, for and uh, so we spent the, uh, the past five days on that. And uh, we'd like to show you what we've managed to pull off so far. So what currently works relatively reliably is the following. So you can, you can autocomplete salt state names, as you can see, uh, once I type the dot in, the extension presents me all the correct subnames of the uh, of the git state, and it shows me here the documentation. So the document, uh, so all of this is pulled from salt doc, and this also works with other ones. For instance, PKG, I get all this uh, all this information that I need, and so on. So another thing that we then also worked with that the language server protocol supports is jump to definitions. And here we, op, uh, here we tried out salt IDs. So here, if you have such an require, you can, uh, you can define this thing somewhere else and you can go to jump to definition, whoop, and it will throw you in here. And this also works with other stuff. For instance, here I see the jackal gem, it's defined up there. And I get put my my cursor jumps into here. So if I if this was off screen, I would get uh, I would get there. Yeah. And so that's uh, that's essentially the main features that we are, were able to implement. And now, Cedric is going to cover the challenges that we faced. Well, uh, before going to to the challenges, there's one other uh, the completion that we're supporting is uh, includes. So when you're adding an include, 
and in your state in your state you can it will just uh, propose you all the inflows from the repository so here right. you see i forgot about the, that the pep okay so as for for the challenges so uh, in order to to provide completion we need to be aware of where the user is typing in the uh, the structure of the state, the state file. And this requires parsing. Parsing and extracting the context uh, of, of, the, um, of the editing. Um, so far, we did it pretty basically with um, a YAML parser. But uh, it's not um, working if you're typing something that is not yet a valid YAML. So if it's not yet valid YAML, typically it will just break and not provide any completion at all. So this, um, we have worked on, on, on that um, during these five days, but it's not fully there yet. So we had to reuse a PyYAML tokenizer to get tokens and then build an abstract syntax tree out of that. And then the, the other challenge that you have is that here in the demo, you had a state file that had no Jinja in it. So when the, um, the state you're editing is perfectly valid YAML, it's okay. But when you start adding Jinja blocks in there, it can turn into a mess. Um, so we have tried to, to find some solutions to, um, to work around that issue. They're hacky, not perfect, well, pretty complex and um, not yet fully implemented. So now for the future. So the future of that work is first finishing the abstract syntax tree construction and actually using it. And, and once this is done, then we will be able to move on to more features like implementing autocomplete in more places. Uh, for example, for instance, auto-completing the uh, state IDs, um, maybe some other things. But why not also adding some uh, Jinja auto-completion or uh, go to definition or whatever. Maybe having a salt link integration may be cool, uh, showing documentation, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Um, just because I know the question will arrive, we are fully aware that there is already a VS Code extension doing ex almost exactly this. Um, this extension is not implementing a, salt, um, a language server protocol. So that would mean that we would have to copy it over for other editors. And yeah. And it is not as complete, it's, it's not super complete and super not super accurate when it comes to it to completion. So that's it. We have a few links there to, uh, for you, um, just for the code, for a language or protocol specifications, uh, for the image in the first slides. And that's it. So maybe you have questions. Um, is this what's the target group for this one developers or also users of of salt in the ui of SUSE manager or uni uh chip, typically the basic target is to develop the source state developer so that uh, when you cr create the source states to uh, configure your state machines you can have something uh, convenient but i I think there are some web editors and it could not be such a such a dream to imagine um, a web editor integrated somehow into a uni and having such uh, completion features for writing states. Why not? Yep. Yeah, especially since uh, there's, there's about a dozen uh, VS Code spin-offs that uh, that run just in the web so github code spaces are one but there's uh, there's also there's also some that are not uh, not tied to github uh, whatsoever 
so you can you could integrate this if you have a if you have a web server running you can just plop that in there and pre-install extensions and since this is based on vs code it supports the language server protocol so that would work there uh, just fine okay yeah this is super cool so but my question is have you thought of integrating with the uni uh, API so that you can auto complete, for instance, the support channels, the configuration channels, stuff like that? Uh, no, not yet. <laughs> so far, we're just uh, trying to stick to what Salt is defining. And it's already quite a lot. I think by the end of the week, we start, we, we managed to, to hate Jinja and YAML at the same time. Especially the combination throwing both into the mix make it really challenging. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, this is super cool. Any more questions? If not, I think we have Silvio here that you know, he, he can talk about the containerization. Right, Silvio? Yeah, correct. So thank you, Cedric. Thank you, Dan. Great project. Let me try to see if I can share my screen. Hopefully you can see my slide deck. Works. Is it visible? Okay, cool. So uh, during Hack Week, we tried to put to Uni in containers. Oh, <clears throat> as you know, Uni uh, uh, was, uh, was born long ago uh, from a source code perspective. And it, it's kind of, uh, you know, uh, historically in his, in his heritage that uh, it's, it's a little bit like a monolith or a, a number, a small number of monoliths in terms of architecture. This was way, way before containers were born. Any, any, any such technology was, was prevalent. So um, we set out this hack week with a very ambitious, over ambitious goal actually, um, to actually be able to deploy Uyuni uh, inside of the of the Ranger marketplace. So um, uh, assuming you have some Kubernetes clusters and and you are managing them with Rancher. Uh, then uh, you are able to deploy applications like uh, like those that, that are sh been showing on screen now. And, and the idea was, okay, what if we could put Uyuni in there and just install it as easily as, as, as one click and then Uyuni is now running on your cluster. Now, of course, this is, there's, there's a long way uh, before, before we can actually do something like that. But the first and most important step is, is to containerize Uyuni components. And, and we had a lot to learn uh, about containerization in general and, and, and Kubernetes and all the related technologies. So we, we took Hack Week as, as the occasion to, to learn and experiment and see uh, how, how far we could get. Uh, so the, the first thing, um, I'm going to talk uh, to you about three things uh, today. The first is uh, what did we build? What did we achieve? Because of course, Hack Week is, is, is mainly about uh, tinkering and try to try to try to build something, no matter if it does make complete sense or not. Uh, so the first thing uh, that, that that we did was to try to containerize the Uni proxy. Now, why the proxy and not the server? Uh, because it's a lot easier. So um, uh, uh, I, that that was our our first uh, yeah context with uh, with the whole uh, container world. Not exactly the first, but the first in, in this kind of endeavor. So we started from, from the, the easy one and then try to get some lessons uh, to, to then apply to, to the bigger beast. So that's why we started from the proxy. And um, the, the initial approach was the so-called fat container approach where you have one container and everything in it, which resembles uh, a lot what, what's, uh, what's in the proxy VM as, as of today. Because once again, that's the easiest approach, and then you can break it down. Um, calling it fat, yeah, it's 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 something you can do. Um, the other thing that we did was um, to uh, attach it to a volume, so that uh, if for whatever reason uh, your uh, Uni proxy container goes away, it's it's burned, it's destroyed. You can replace it with a fresh one, which is exactly identical, connected to the same volume. And, and all the long-term um, uh, uh, data stored will remain there, and basically you 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 not notice the, the difference at all. Uh, so the the volume will contain, uh, for example, all 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 cached uh, packages, 
and everything that that is permanent, like ESSL certificates and everything else. So um, this worked. Uh, the other thing that we did was to try to slim it down once once it was working. Um, so um, calling it a fat container is, yeah, uh, debatable in the sense that the proxy doesn't contain a lot of software. Uh, mainly, we're talking about an Apache web server and a Squid web cache and 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 a small com uh, component called a salt broker uh, to 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 basically proxy the salt connections. Uh, but we did manage to split those into three. Uh, separate containers and, and have uh, that them all, all running on top of um, uh, Docker and Podman in, in, in this case. So um, yeah, from, from this perspective, uh, it, it worked quite well. Um, the other thing that we tried, and this is still a work in progress because Hack Week is not finished yet, so we hope to be able to actually conclude uh, this uh, by the end of Hack Week, is uh, to run it all also on K3S. It's not like there is a fixed plan. Are we going to use Podman or K3S? It's more about learning uh, about the different options and see the pros and cons of what we can do with technology. So that's why uh, K3S, yeah, it's, it's, it's here on this slide, but it's still work in progress at this point. And then the, the interesting part was, was the Uni server, of course. Um, and, 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 and this is, is really a fat container. So at the moment, there's, there's really a lot of software in it. So um, yeah, uh, we we're still in the initial phase where we have everything in one place. Um, again, this, this was, was tested with, with Podman. Uh, and, and, and the cool thing is uh, it does really work and we tested it. And I hope Ricardo's online, he, he will show you in a while. It really does work on top of CentOS and, uh, and Ubuntu. We tried CentOS 7 and Ubuntu uh, 2004. So um, uh, we, we, it is really possible to, uh, to uh, really leverage the, the, the uh, portability of, of containerization. Uh, when it done right. Of course, there's, there's still a lot to do, but at least, um, yeah, we, we could prove the concept and play with the technology. Um, again, here we have some work in progress to make it uh, run on top of K3S, even with, with Helm. Um, and uh, we hope to have uh, something uh, demoable uh, in, the, in this area sometime soon. Um, so the first thing was building, the second thing was learning. I kind of mentioned it already, so we learned a lot about a lot of, of, of different technology in, in the, in the uh, container uh, realm. Uh, we learned about uh, building containers, running them, deploying them, uh, some basics about K3S and, K and Kubernetes in general, Helm, and so on. And then the third and most important thing in the model, which we did during Hack Week, is actually to have a lot of fun, which is the whole point of Hack Week. So we really enjoyed the experience. Uh, oh yeah, by the way, we got uh, we we acquired another company, so I think it's fair to add a second happy animal here at this point. Um, in case you want to learn more about uh, this uh, this this Hack Week project and especially uh, what, what, what are the next steps, or uh, what we might end up doing as, as, as a result of what we've learned. Um, there is the HackWick project page. I will paste the link in the chat in a while. Um, there are more, many more um, technical details uh, in, in this page, and also a link to a, to a wiki page, which was kind of a, a scratch pad uh, during the project, and, and, and also contains um, some some information about what what what's needed next before we can at some point um, uh, have have this uh, really as an option in in Uni first and then maybe one day uh, also uh, in Source Manager. And that's it for my presentation. Are there any questions? We have one from Jordi at the chat about Jabardi. Yeah. So. Um, you have to know Hack Week is, is, is for having fun, which means uh, you are basically allowed to cut a lot of corners that you wouldn't be able otherwise. One of those corners that we deliberately chose to cut uh, was uh, in anything about the traditional stack. Now, this is no decision. This is just a Hack Week um, compromise at this point. So we just forgot about the traditional world for a while and, 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 and tried it out that way, of course, 
uh, at the moment this works, we will have to think a little bit again whether uh, it's worth it to, to complicate the picture and, 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 and really support the traditional stack or just say, hey, if, if you want the latest and greatest Uyuni on top of containers, uh, that uh, you will just have to use salt and, and the minion system. Sure, I just, I just um, didn't know if you just uh, do it on purpose to make it simpler or, or, or there was any problem with uh, the Java minion. Um, yeah. Then I have one question, if I can. Um, so the the um, one thing that I was thinking while you were speaking. So if we put everything in containers, uh, how do we manage the subscriptions? Because if I remember correctly, if you have a container uh, manager, it should get the subscriptions from the host. So then you cannot run the server on CentOS because you don't have a subscription. Have you, I don't know, have you found this this issue or? or? Well, um, the the thing is that uh, SUSE manager already and, and, and Uyuni, uh, of course, uh, doesn't place any limitation um, over 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 what to do with the software, even if you if you run out of subscriptions. So what what SUSE manager does is allow you to know whether you are using an appropriate number of subscriptions or uh, or, or you're overusing them or or you need to to buy some more. So there is a reporting functionality. But other than that, it's not like. Um, uh, the moment we find out that, uh, oops, you're running one server without a subscription, we block that server or we block any functionality at all. We never want to stop our our customers' production systems for, for, for no reason. They can always give us a call and, 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 and the sales representative will, will fix it up. So at the moment, uh, uh, given that the, the possibility of running a server in, in Uyuni on top of CentOS or, or, or Ubuntu doesn't even exist, uh, we don't really have a problem in terms of specifying subscriptions and SUSE manager either. The moment this will be possible in the, in the open source project, it would be the right moment to go to our pro project product managers and tell them, hey, here, what if we enable this for the release product as well. What would be the consequences on the subscription side of things, on the business side of things? Will it cost more? Will it cost less? Will it require a different activation uh, scheme or whatever? And then we will have that, that conversation if, if, if that day comes when it comes. But at the moment, I wouldn't be worried at all. For, for Uni, this is not a concern. Uni is free on the episodes and it's it's not a technical problem. The subscriptions. Okay. And how was the experience, Silvio? You said you had big containers. How big was the footprint? Uh, what was surprisingly maybe maybe was it faster than on a installation on VM? I mean, how was the experience? Um, can I respond with a quick demo? Um, <laughs> sure. Uh, because, I, because I think I, I think that that oh, doesn't awesome. work fine. So um, let me share my screen again. So here you have a few terminals, and here you have an, a new Uni system. This Uni system has a few machines um, registered. That's that's irrelevant. What we want to do is to add a new containerized proxy and uh, to link up a minion. Hopefully this, this all works. I, I promise it did work 10 minutes ago. <laughs> um, so uh, the, 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 the way you do it is um, you go to your server. So here is, is the server console. And, um, and then you run this, this new command here, create proxy config. You give it a name, this is the name of the proxy, and you give it uh, your username and password in clear. As you can see, I'm, I don't have a, a, a lot of creativity for passwords. Um, if you run this command, uh, it will ask you the password for the certificate authority, and then I will explain why that is the case. And it will generate uh, SSL certificates for a new proxy and, and put them in a proxy config directory together with some other crypto material. Uh, it will also uh, immediately register the new proxy 
And here you can see it here. It's not a real proxy at, the, at this point in time. It's just an, an entry in, in, in the system view. It does, it does nothing attached, you know? But the, the entry was already created. At this point, um, what you can do is to copy over um, this, this special directory uh, into another host. Don't mind, I need the root password here. It's, it's, it's unimportant. Once you have that directory on um, on a, a host that has Docker or Podman, uh, you can run a special script, which is called run proxy. And what it does uh, is uh, it, uh, it will start uh, the container with a proxy, configure it, by the way, with salt, of course, and start it. And this is done. The proxy is actually ready at this point. So it's blindingly fast. Um, at this point, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I will start uh, the minion process on the minion VM that I have here. Once it is started, it does uh, what you expect. So the key will appear on the server. It's unaccepted because I don't run with auto automatic key acceptance. I will accept the key. And now the minion is accepted. So um, that means I can uh, immediately ping it. And it's already responding. Yeah, yellow on white is not, not the best thing in the world. But and this yeah, minion is connected via, via the proxy, right? And this minion is connected via the proxy. And, uh, and the minion is actually already here. And if you look at the proxy, you see it's connected through the proxy. So yes. um, in terms of starting up a new proxy, it's amazingly fast, which is one of the reasons why I'm interested. I mean, I'm a developer myself. I spin up and down virtual machines all the time to test out all scenarios, to develop new things. So starting VMs, and recreating configurations is a big part of my day as a developer. And I can only imagine how, how fast it could be to spin up, I don't know, three servers, five proxies, and 10 minions if they were all containerized this way. So this, this will make it much, much easier to try out as a manager, uh, or you need the first time if you just want to play with it, uh, to contribute uh, if you're a developer, and, and of course, uh, if, you, if you're part of the core team. And, and hopefully also at customers, if they need to spin up uh, and down proxies very fast, this, this could be uh, a, a nice thing. And I can, only, um, I can only dream about the day where we can do the same with the server as well. And how big are the, are the images? At the do moment, you know they that? are pretty big. Yeah, uh, the proxy image is about 800 megabytes, which is big. Yes. Um, the thing is that um, what we found out is uh, that our our packages have a lot more dependencies that they need to have. So um, basically, when when we install the first package, it will pull in the the rest of the entire proxy universe, even if you don't need it. And uh, this is one of the points that 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 we will have to fix to continue this. And uh, we definitely expect the sizes to go down dramatically. Now, I don't expect that to go down to three megabytes anytime soon, um, but it should be a lot, lot less. Cool. Thank you for showing it. Uh, Silvio, this is yes? Christian. I have a question. This was an example of creating uh, a, a proxy, uh, which is also seen from the SUSE manager as uh, as a standalone proxy, but basically it was running in a containerized uh, version. Um, you mentioned also that there was Kubernetes in place. Uh, do you see the long term that it would be possible to just have more scalability in SUSE Manager by, uh, you know, if we're talking about Kubernetes, that we just fire, depend on the workload, maybe new instances of um, a salt broker if we running out of uh, resources so that uh, we can 
make some rules which defines uh, when it's time to start new instances so that the the whole idea of just making this Kubernetes cluster is that it will just uh, be able to create new instances. I mean, not instances in terms of, uh, from so the manager point of view, like new proxies, but I mean the same proxy, but maybe give them new, new uh, somehow Docker images for uh, the squid or maybe the, uh, the salt broker uh, and of course, assuming we have a uh, layer four switch in front of it, so otherwise you should have new IP addresses, which doesn't make sense. So that means that the minions are talking always to the same logical unit, you know, but in the background, we just are able to cascade more. I, I can't tell you how, how curious I am to, to dig into that territory. So. As, as soon as your application is built on top of Kubernetes, then you get all Kubernetes power at your disposal, which means a lot of things in uh, scalability and HA areas uh, are, 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 uh, you have tools to implement them built in into the platform. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean it's easy or straightforward, but it does mean that there is the possibility. And I definitely see the possibility in terms of uh, proxy services and even more in terms of uh, server services. Like um, if you have a, a unit proxy, uh, being able to spin up uh, multiple Tomcat servers uh, or, or multiple Apache servers or multiple salt masters. So um, it's not like, um, Containerizing your application gives you those things for free, but definitely it opens up a door. It, it makes us closer to such kind of architectures. And I'm really looking forward to, to developments in that, in that area. I can't promise you anything. Um, it, as you said uh, correctly, it's, it's long-term future thinking that, that we're engaging in right now. Um, but, uh, but yeah, this is, this is very interesting territory to explore and I look forward to do that. Okay, thanks. But as this is an Hack Week project, Silvio, will will there be a follow up on this project, or yes, how will it go on? <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you that there will be a follow up, a, a lot yeah. of follow up. So that means we should not open uh, bugs so many, so that Silvio has more time to <laughs> work on and all the others <laughs> and all the I, others. I, yeah, I, I have. I have to say uh, one very important thing. I was not alone in this project. Actually, most of the work was not done by me. What I did was the presentation at the end. But uh, <laughs> what, what you've seen here is by and large um, the, the, the work from Michael Kalmer from, uh, and from Ricardo Mateus uh, that's, uh, the, 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 that you're seeing here. Uh, with a little bit uh, of help also also from, from others, uh, our, our SALT colleagues and our uh, the Kubernetes colleagues are responding to our, uh, you know, new, newcomer questions. But uh, yeah, uh, so this is, this is definitely not anything on, on me. Uh, this, is, this is something that, that will involve many more people in the team. And even if the hack week was by the three of us, I am absolutely sure others uh, will join forces uh, when we go digging deeper into these topics. Cool. cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so since we have uh, three minutes, I can show you guys a uh, uni running in a Podman container. Super cool. <laughs> okay, so I will start sharing my screen. You guys should be able to see the terminal right now. Yeah. Yes. So uh, in the top, um, I have SUS manager uh, or uni running in a container. And I have this minion ready to onboard. You can see that uh, this is running in this virtual machine. Uh, and I will just onboard this minion, then I will show you how it is doing. So, it looks and I will onboarding. So, let me show the salt keys. 
So this machine is uh, a virtual machine running on Libvirt, and inside that virtual machine, I have installed Podman and start a container with Podman. So the key is already accepted. And the system should show up in here in a few moments. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> During the onboard, I can show you uh, this is the output. You can see that the keys are already accepted. In the meantime, I have another machine in here um, with uh, uh, is with Ubuntu installed. Okay. I don't have any container. And I will start uh, the uni container in here. Okay. This will run the bootstrap script and uh, initialize all the database. Okay. And in the meantime, you can see that the system, not that machine is very slow because I have too much stuff running. System should be should yeah the system is here. I can increase the font, and you can see that uh, is event history. Although do I refresh list is there? I stay everything. Okay, back to the Ubuntu one. So you can see that the database is being populated. Everything is being created. This is using a pre-built um, image where the Duny is already installed and the database is also already installed. Okay, now it's importing for the certificate. Okay, it should be almost there. And the machine is this uh, one. Yeah, it's Ubuntu. If I enter, you can see that certificate here because it's self signed. The first time that you say is a little bit slower. You should press that turbo button on the bottom of your laptop. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the first organization screen, I can uh, all the fields and voila. You need running inside uh, Ubuntu image with a container that runs um, on OpenSUSE. And the container image is running open to the lib 15.2. And that's what I have to, to show you. Cool. How much space does that container need? Well, the server right after installation, uh, when I'm exporting with Podman, it's like 1.3 gigabytes. Only the installation um, with until, the first update. Until you sync a channel, right? Right. Just the initial installation <laughs> ready to create the first organization. Well, but that's, I mean, <laughs> if you need to change channels, it will, it will not matter the platform very much. Just the bulk of it will start to get larger. So my question is to, um, and you mentioned this already about the potential of decoupling the monolith so that elements like the database or the salt master are uh, decoupled to be on separate, separately managed 
either VMs or container instances. So uh, is that something that's on people's radar or how is that planned in future? It's it's on the radar. So especially the carving out the database uh, is, is the first thing to attempt. It's probably not the easiest part. Um, it could even be the easiest part to carve out actually. So, um, I, I guess that that will be a natural first step. Whether we do that in or when we do that is still up to discussion, but uh, that will definitely be the first step. Yeah, um, yes. the infrastructure yes. is, is saying uh, uh, database so it's been solved. Uh, would be the, the first logical uh, thing to, to decouple. Uh, and uh, other things us. like uh, Taskomatic okay. will be probably a bit more difficult because uh, well, they I'm share sorry. a lot of code um, base with the web application. Uh, so uh, that will be uh, a little bit more difficult. Anyway, guys, we, we are running out of time. We are already four minutes past the hour. But one thing before we leave, because I didn't mention this when I asked for collaboration testing ARM, a uh, big thanks to, and I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly, Guillaume Gardet from ARM, because he already started some weeks ago giving it a test and provided, uh, providing us with valuable feedback. So yeah, I had to say that big thanks to him. Thank you very much. And we can continue the discussion in the GitHub chat and in the mailing lists. And yeah, we'll meet again in one month, in four weeks. Thank you, everybody, for joining. And thank you to the presenters. Yeah, thanks, thank everybody. You. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy the thanks. weekend. Thanks bye for bye. having us. Bye. Bye.